Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and we're in an added lesson in the series on Rosh Hashanah. This is lesson number four. And this was a result of some research that I was doing back in Exodus chapter 20, starting in about verse 18. And in my research and in my study and in my access of fellow scholars, I learned some amazing aspects of a certain verse. It, 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 its meaning surprised me. And it suggested another way that Scripture testifies of Yeshua. Remember in John 5, 39, Jesus says, Scripture testifies of me. He says that between 24 and 30 A.D., all the, the only Bible that they had was the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. But here's God, Jesus saying, Scripture testifies of me. Now, in those days, again, it's the Old Testament and Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were the foundation of the Bible in those days. So, I mean, Jesus also could have said that the Torah testifies of me. Now, this verse that I'm talking about also seems to be related to God's feast, Yom Teruah the day of the shofar blast. Now, the rabbis renamed it to Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, and Rosh Hashanah is not in the Bible referencing this feast in the fall. It's not the new year. Now, the Jewish people have their own traditions and their practices and what they do in the synagogue and at home and so on. Some of the practices are not in the Bible, and for us, though, for us Christians, we bless them. And we say, that's all well and good, but we want to come back to the Torah to say, what does it say and what doesn't it not say? And again, it depends solely on, the, on putting the Bible's historical context. So let me show you this amazing connection see, and see if you agree with me that Yam Teruah, the day of the blast, again, known as Rosh Hashanah, points to Yeshua. I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. And this is one verse, two verses that I really want to talk about, and this is the first one. And this one's quite amazing. Exodus 20, verse 18. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. <laughs> now, when you take a look at the Hebrew, I'm not going to try to give you a Hebrew lesson, but if you go into the Hebrew, it's not perceived the thunder. They saw it. That's what it says. They saw with their eyes the thunderings. They saw with their eyes the sounds of the shofar they saw with their eyes the lightnings well thundering and the sound of the shofar is a little weird to see it you can see lightning but what's fascinating is the word for thunderings is has an also equivalent meaning for voices for tongues and in the bible when you're reading about tongues you're reading about a foreign language or you've got the sounds of the shofar, but what about lightning or lightnings? <clears throat> it has an equivalent meaning for fire torches. Now this is really interesting. Why this choice of words? And with these equivalent meanings of tongues and fire torches. Let's do a what if. What if we ask... What does this verse say if we use equivalent meanings of the Hebrew? Well, if we go to back, back to Exodus 20, 18, the people saw tongues. They saw voices. And on top of that, they saw fire torches and the sounds of the shofar. You know, guys, this reminds me of Pentecost or Shavuot in Acts chapter 2. Let's go there, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 
2 and 3, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Now, isn't this interesting? Let's do a comparison. At Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, there's a sound of a rushing wind. And at Sinai, there was the sound of a shofar blowing. It's a wind that's blowing through the shofar. So we have this concept of the blowing of wind. At Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we have tongues, voices. And at Sinai, we have thunderings, which also could mean voices, tongues. And there were flames of fire in Acts chapter 2. And here, the translation into English in New American Standard, and I don't know what it might say in your version, but the Hebrew is torches of fire, not lightnings. This is amazing. This, this makes a connection between Acts chapter 2 the Christian Pentecost that's so famous, and also the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now, guys, you could check this out, this connection between the giving of the Ten Commandments and Pentecost. Go to the website, very easy, lightamenorah.org. And remember, menorah spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H, so it's lightamenorah. Treat it as one word, lightamenorah.org. When you get there, look at the top of the page and off on the right-hand side at the little mark, the little options that you have at the top of the screen. Click on other resources, and when you do that, you can click on the option for podcast playlists. And in there, go down and you can find the podcast playlist on Shavuot or Pentecost. And you will learn more about the connection between the giving of the Ten Commandments and Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2. But then, also, if you find the podcast playlist for Exodus, go there and look up Exodus Lesson 46, Part 1, and Exodus Lesson 46, Part 2. We're emphasizing what's going on in Exodus chapter 19 when they arrive at Sinai. And this also talks about the connection God made, not the rabbis. Rabbis made that connection later. But here is God, his own word, making connections between the giving of the Ten Commandments and Pentecost. It's just amazing. Now God is doing this, like I said, not the rabbis. He's connecting Sinai and the Ten Commandments. A new covenant given to the people at the mountain of God called Sinai. And he's connecting it to Jerusalem, the coming of the Spirit, as part of the new covenant at the mountain of God of Jerusalem. So when we look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, there's an amazing choice of words in Hebrew and not English. Guys, if we saw what they saw, we'd be scared of our, out of our minds as well. Now, on a basic level, English level, New American Standard level, they saw thunderings. That's a sound. It says they saw the noise of the shofar. That's a sound. They saw sound. Even dismissing the equivalent meanings of what those words are. This is crazy. This is so awesome. It's astounding. But with God, our God, we can say, so what else is new? He is awesome. He's astounding. His acts are unbelievable. So in 1446 BC, the Ten Commandments are given. And the events in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18 just follows just after the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now, one year later, the tabernacle is erected on Nisan 1. Now, Nisan is the biblical lunar month for the month of Passover. 
Passover is going to be on Nisan 14, which is going to be the full moon. But when we take a look at the end of Exodus, start and go back to Exodus chapter 40, it's one year later on the first of Nisan, God commands that the tabernacle will be erected. And that happens, and then we get into Leviticus. So it's sometimes it's sometime after the tabernacle of God has been erected. God talks to Moses from the Holy of Holies. Now, this is in Leviticus 1.1. Moses is not in the Holy of Holies with God. It says God talks to Moses from the Holy of Holies. So like I said, this is probably weeks after the tabernacle has been erected. God's presence comes down. This is in Exodus 40, verses 34 to 35. And that was the first anniversary of the first Passover on the first day of the month. Now, so God is teaching Moses, God is talking to him from his sanctuary, and he's teaching him all the stuff in Leviticus, talking about his feasts, the sacrifices, the appointed times, the Moedim. He's teaching Moses to teach his people. And all this is at Sinai. And they're still there. So when we take a look, we can read in Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. This is one of those verses that God spoke to Moses from the Holy of Holies. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel. In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. Now, I am positive the Hebrews understood what a shofar was. They're shepherds, and they probably used shofars in their own shepherding. But what's very fascinating is this. The word shofar does not appear in the Torah, in the Bible, until Sinai. <laughs> this is amazing. We have to understand this. This blowing of the shofar is related to their experience, and we need to understand what they did so it enhances our understanding and enriches our walk with the Good Shepherd, Jesus. So like I said, the first time in the Bible the word the shofar is used is in Exodus 19, verses 16 through 20. Reading from the New American Standard, so it came about on the third day when it was the morning that there were there were thunder and lightning flashes <clears throat> and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound. Actually, the Hebrew is shofar, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. A shofar, a teruah, a blast a loud noise, a shofar sound. This is the first time we read about a shofar in the Bible, and it's at Sinai. It's on the day of the blast. And this is a blast. It's all connected to God coming down at Sinai for the first time. God is coming down to do all this people for the first time. Now, in previous lessons, you may have heard me present material about other shofar events. Like, for instance, when Solomon was crowned king, there was a shofar uh, blown at his inauguration. Uh, in Jesus' day, though this is not in the Bible, there was a shofar that's blown in every town uh, from the synagogue to announce when the Sabbath was going to start so people would understand that sundown is coming up. And to me, I suggested in previous lessons that these other shofar events is what God possibly wants us to remember. All of these shofar events. Matter of fact, one rabbi, and I believe I've discussed him in previous lessons, Saadia Geon, he lived in uh, from 1882 to 942 AD. In his study 
with regards to this feast, Yom Teruah, by that time, uh, in talking about the 9th, 10th century AD, it, Rosh Hashanah, that name was already being used. And Rabbi Gaon found 10 reasons for blowing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, or 10 sh shofar events that need to be remembered. Now, this is uh, a link that I've provided. Uh, and if you take a look underneath the picture with regards to this lesson or underneath the actual place where you clicked play, um, there should be a way of accessing more information that I've provided. And in there, I provided a couple of links so that you can actually read the words of Sa'adia Geon, Rabbi Sa'adia Geon, and his 10 shofar uh, events that he says are related to Rosh Hashanah. Now, God inspired Moses to write Leviticus 23 for the Hebrews. And we need to ask, what is it that the Hebrews understood at Sinai? They didn't know about many of these other 10 shofar events. And like I said at the beginning, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible not say? And we want to put it in its historical perspective. So let's review what's going on here at Sinai. One, God comes down on the mountain of God, Sinai. You can read about Sinai being the mountain of God in Exodus 3.1, Exodus 4.27, and Exodus 24, 13. And this is all connected to the New Covenant, which is the Ten Commandments. God said that. That's in Exodus 34, 28. God's very words. These words of the Ten Commandments are the New Covenant. Now, it's the first time God comes down to dwell with us. This is exactly what it says in Exodus 25, verse 8. Exodus 25, verse 8, God says, I want to come and dwell with my people. And it's the first time God comes down to dwell with his people. And it's the first time the shofar is used in Exodus 19, verse 16. So, I mean, you could do a, you could do a search. I don't care what version of the Bible you're using for trumpet or horn or shofar. And like I said, the first time this occurs is in Exodus 19. Now, continuing to review what's going on here at Sinai, all God's people are gathered together to meet with the Lord. This is precisely what it says in Exodus 19, verse 17, that Moses gathered the people together to bring them to Sinai so they can meet with the Lord. This is precise. But <laughs> this is critical. This is awesome. It's a spectacular real event in 1446 BC, but it testifies of Yeshua HaMashiach. It testifies of Jesus the Messiah. It testifies of Jesus Christ. What I just reviewed, we're going to see that the connections of these events to Jesus are just too awesome. For instance, we said God came down at Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And we know Jesus will return to Jerusalem, which is called the mountain of God. The mountain of God had moved. Jerusalem as the mountain of God, you can read about this in Isaiah 2, chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Isaiah 66, verse 20. Or Micah, chapter 4, verses 1 through and 3. And there's others, places. So as God came down at the mountain of God at Sinai, Jesus will come down at the mountain of God at Jerusalem. At Sinai, it was all connected to the new covenant. And here's Jesus who instituted the new covenant at the mountain of God. He completes the Sinai covenant. And he's the promise of the gospel. And Paul talks about this in Galatians 3 verse 8. Paul says, what's the gospel? He said, the gospel is what was preached to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. 
And in Genesis chapter 12, one of those promises was that through you, Abraham, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Jesus is that blessing. And we come to the fact that at Sinai, it was the first time that God came down to dwell with his people. But with Jesus coming down at his second coming, it's the last time God will come to dwell with us. It's over. It's the end of days. This is in Revelation 21, verse 3. It's exact. God comes down to dwell with us. At Sinai, it was the first time the shofar was used in the Torah. And in Jesus' return, it's announced by the blast of the shofar, teruah. You can read about this in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. I remember when you're reading in Acts chapter 1, the 120 disciples were there on the mountain. And there were two men dressed in white after Jesus ascended to the Father. And he said, hey, you guys, why are you looking up at him? He's coming back in the same way. He's coming back to Jerusalem, to the mountain of God. And in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, Jesus even says it will be the sound of the trumpet. Actually, the sound of the last shofar. And just at Sinai, where Moses brought all of the people to Sinai to meet with God. In Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, we are going to be gathered to him, his elect, his chosen ones, to meet with him. This, this is amazing, you guys. These connections. The first time that God came to dwell with us at the mountain of God at Sinai, to the last time that God will come down to the mountain of God, now Jerusalem, and dwell with us. I suggest to you that Yam Teruah, which you know and I know by Rosh Hashanah, which is a name that is actually a mistaken name, but Yam Teruah is to connect this first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord. The first coming to dwell with us, the last coming to dwell with us. I suggest to you that this probably, this alone, this correlation that we went through is probably the primary connection that God is making to himself. It's not the other shofars, like the shofars that Rabbi Geon had brought up. <laughs> you guys, this is a powerful reason for the church to have a service on Rosh Hashanah. It's about God. It's about the first and the last. It's about Jesus. And yet, sadly, few churches will keep God's feast. Most won't even mention it. Some of their background is the fact that, oh, those are Jewish feasts. It doesn't say that in Leviticus 23, verses 1 through 2. God said, these are mine. But we've been trained. Our tradition in the teaching that we've heard, oh, these are Jewish feasts, we don't have to do that. God, Jesus did away with the Old Covenant. That's all old stuff. How wrong they are. Now, it's amazing to me that in the church, and I've experienced this over the years, there will be a great, sometimes a great July 4th service on a Sunday, either before or after July 4th. And it talks about our country, the United States, and the celebration of birth of the United States. Or what about Father's Day? Great Sunday sermons upon fatherhood and the importance of being a father. Or Mother's Day. Or what about graduation Sunday in the spring? A, a service where the kids come up and they're prayed over because they're graduating high school. But God's appointed times... Like Rosh Hashanah? Nothing. Nada. Silence in the churches. Silence on a day where Jew and Gentile, disciples of Yeshua, should blow the shofar and remember the first and the last. 
Silence on a day where Jew and Gentile should remember God coming to dwell with his chosen the first time. At Sinai, the mountain of God. Jew and Gentile remembering God is returning to dwell with his chosen the last time at Jerusalem, which is the mountain of God. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50 that Jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the Father, just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands. It could very well be that Jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. I'd like to end our session with that blessing, that blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses, to Aaron, to bless the people. Yevarekeinu Adonai Vishmarkeinu, Yair Adonai Panava Aleinu, Bekunekeinu, Isa Adonai Panava Aleinu, Viasem Lanu Shalom, Vishem Yeshua Adonainu, Amen. So together, let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.